All right, thank you everyone for sticking around to the end of the day. I'm aware I stand between you and dinner, uh, and so I will attempt to stand here for only as long as is needed. <laughs> so uh, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna talk about four main things in this presentation. Um, I'm gonna give a brief intro uh, about my perspective on open source software uh, and kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, talk briefly uh, through a demo of this project Matico or Matico, still up for debate. Um, and kind of show what that can do. Uh, and then talk about uh, how you can contribute to this project, uh, which is very relevant to cartographic and mapping concerns, uh, or to other projects more generally. So uh, as per my introduction, I'm part of the Healthy Regions Policies Lab. Uh, work on a lot of different applications, uh, here highlighting the US COVID Atlas and the uh, Opioid Environment Policy Scan Explorer. Um, we focus on a lot of different things, but trying to understand place and neighborhood and health, uh, all through the lens of spatial analysis and geospatial data science. So open source and open science are a huge emphasis of the Healthy Regions and Policies Lab and the Center for Spatial Data Science. It provides transparent, forkable, replicable pieces of code, of data, of information, and of science, scientific inquiry. This really enables our peers to modify and build directly on what we've done now and for future efforts to look back at what was done and build what they need. But what exactly makes open source different than more traditional software ownership models for folks writing and using these projects and for folks contributing to these projects? So there are a lot of different ways that a project can get to become open source, um, but there are a few different things that make uh, this kind of model different. Um, and so here highlighting transparency and replicability uh, sustainability and durability, if a service goes away or changes, that open source product can still be used. Uh, greater extensibility and feedback uh, and community uh, contributing back to that project. So with those last two being the focus for today. So a quick example, stepping out of our domain here in cartography uh, to give a little bit of context to think about what open source can do. So uh, I'm gonna talk for just a minute about AI image generation. Uh, so basically the idea here, you take a text prompt and then it outputs an image. In this case, we're using DALI and we feed in a large conference hall of cartographers gathered to discuss practical cartography. Uh, and these are the images we get out, which uh, maybe not quite uh, respecting the diversity, but you know, it's, uh, it's doing its best. So DALI 2, what generated that image is a proprietary model and it's a really powerful tool. Uh, it has a pretty user-friendly user interface. You can interact with it a few ways as an API. It's a really cool uh, kind of tool that's available. But in that same space, there's an open source model called Stable Diffusion. And it does similar things, kind of a similar concept, but the community has rallied around that to implement it in a ton of different ways. There's a Photoshop plugin that you can interactively draw with AI and co-create these sort of things. Uh, there are user interfaces that run on Mac M1s to kind of reduce the barrier and many more applications. This sort of explosive community contribution is the real potential of open source. So I'm gonna share a little bit now uh, about this project uh, Medico that I've been contributing to. Uh, this is a project that's led uh, by Stuart Lynn and myself. Uh, Stuart Lynn is a coworker of mine at East Chicago. Uh, and this is a totally free and open source uh, mapping platform. It's really focused on uh, connecting and working with spatial data, representing spatial data in different ways, uh, and crucially enabling you to build applications uh, with multiple pages, charts, and so on. So it does this all from a graphic user interface. There's no code needed. Uh, and uh, this is a kind of a builder web application type of thing. So some key features here uh, based in the, this kind of graphic builder. Uh, is that you can create pretty sophisticated layouts with different uh, formats and different flows, if it's an article or a dashboard or just a single map sort of interface. Um, you can also do basic GIS operations right in the browser, do filtering, aggregations, joins, uh, and with more coming soon. Uh, and while this is Web Mercator centric, uh, to make use of tiles and labeling uh, standards that are out there, uh, we also have some experimental support for more flexible projections uh, using D3 primarily. This project is really intended to produce cheap outcomes or cheap, cheap to own, cheap to host. And the reason is that makes it much more durable. It can live for a long time. You can throw it up on a GitHub pages or static hosting, and it can live for as long as you want. There's no recurring costs, and it's really cheap to have long term. Lastly, this is a fully open source stack. And while I won't get into this last part, last part too much, it's also extensible with uh, 
WebAssembly modules, which we're calling uh, these kind of compute modules. Uh, so this allows it to borrow from other programming languages and also past uh, experience and expertise that's already been developed. Uh, I'll note here too, just a quick things that we have on the horizon that may be of interest. Uh, we're working to not only on the actual code for these, but to make sure that the specification for how these are described is something that's really thoughtful and extensible. Uh, and we're hopeful to be a, a good borrower of existing things in the space and also to be a good lender, something that can interoperate and work with other projects. So without further ado, we're gonna see if we can get this uh, video to work, hopefully. Okay, so starting in the Matico application builder, we can do some overall customization. This is gonna go pretty quickly just for the sake of time here. Um, but so we're starting with a couple different data sets. Um, we can bring these in from an external link as well as a few different adapters. This first one is a CSV data set of uh, the latest COVID data from our world and data for every country in the world. Uh, we're gonna join this based on the ISO country code. The second one is the world geometries itself. Uh, this is bringing in as a GeoJSON. We have it simplified to a pretty, uh, sim uh, pretty small file size. We're able to import that, and we can see both of those data sets are in there. So, uh, and here's the our world and data, tons of columns and data uh, to work with. So we're then able to do a data set transform and do a tabular join right in the browser. Uh, there's no server, there's no backend. This is happening wherever the client is. Um, so we can set different, transform steps, we want to do aggregating up from a geometry to another one or, or do some sort of filter connect between data sets, we could do that here too. In this case, we're just gonna do a simple join, select the ISO columns for both data sets, um, and then it'll take just a second here. I'm happy to go into the finer points later on about the arrow data model and why this takes a little bit of a sec the first time, but for now, we'll just let it do its thing. Uh, and then in just a moment, it'll output uh, 255 rows, uh, that are the connected geometries to all of the our world and data, COVID data. And there we go. So we can see for Aruba and elsewhere, all of that data plugged in in one place. So next, if I can bring my cursor back here. Oh. And then, so now we can start adding some maps to the application. Um, so first we'll start with a standard kind of Mapbox style web mercator application here. Um, we have different panes that we can draw around the screen and on the right, the editor pane, we're able to change things about it like the location or add additional information. So within this, we can set things like the map bounds that it should go to by default uh, and then start adding some map layers as well. You we can also play around with different default base maps uh, and we're adding custom options for that in the future. So we can go ahead and add that layer. In this case, we'll just do total COVID cases to date. Uh, we can go ahead and add that in. And um, we'll see by default, we have beautiful red, uh, slightly alarming, so we'll work with that. Um, but we're able to choose if we want just a standard color or a data-driven property. And we'll show in a, in a sec how to modify these bins and customize those based on different algorithms for bidding. So we're also able to select which layer this should be underleaved uh, within. So in this case, we can put it under the water layer so we can see the labels and administrative boundaries and those sorts of things. Uh, and we can also go through and add a tooltip super easily. So when you hover over a click on top of a geometry, uh, you're able to see that. And you can have some D3 style formatting here as well. So we can go, in this case, doing the total deaths or total cases rather. We can change what that should be presented as. So we now have uh, some tooltips working. We have a nice map and this is great, but as we all know, there are issues with core clips in a web mercator format. So I'm gonna show you guys as well here uh, how to apply this in a different mapping context. So we can go ahead and make another page and we can leave the interactive one there, but we can call this one something like a globe view or I, I think we'll end up using a natural earth projection. So we can also customize the name of the page, the icon and the path uh, that it takes. Um, so here, instead of calling this new pane, we call it globe view. Uh, and so we can go ahead and you see we'll have a couple different options here as compared to the other mapping pane. So here we can, uh, again, add another layer. Uh, we're trying to kind of keep all of this syntax and all of this grammar as consistent as possible so it's replicable across different uh, efforts in this and across different pane styles. So we have that same data, uh, same beautiful red. Um, so again, we can plug it in to use a data-driven style rather than uh, the single uh, color. 
Uh, and now we can also change the perspective or the uh, projection here. So we have a couple of different default options from D3. Uh, this is one thing we'd love to hear from you all of what and how projections you'd like to see. Um, we also see a small glitch there. Uh, this is definitely a beta product in its adolescence, um, but we're showing it here to get some feedback. So we can see we can play around with it, uh, change some of the settings for the projection, uh, but for this we can go back to natural earth uh, just as, as an option here. So uh, we can also do things like play around with the colors and the bins used uh, for the data visualization. Uh, so in this case, maybe we want a different color scheme for this map versus the other one. We could change it to the purples. We import all of the standard color brewer scales here, as well as some of the D3 color schemes. Uh, and then that's reflected on the map. So we could do more here, um, such as you know, adding more metadata about kind of where did this data come from, the attribution. Uh, and I'm going to try to reverse screen here a little bit and show you guys what this finished project looks like. So as you're building it, it's automatically publishing, it's saving, uh, it's, it's live. Um, and again, this is totally open source and there's no kind of back end here that you're dealing with. So we now have this pretty, pretty nice, pretty straightforward, made in about five minutes, uh, interactive web map. Uh, what's also great about this borrowing data from elsewhere, in this case, our world and data, as they update that data stream, it automatically updates here whenever you load the page. So we can also do, in this case, just a very simple uh, attribution to where this data came from uh, and a little bit about Matico. So to wrap up, um, one more thing that's really interesting about this being an open source effort is that that ethos extends not only to the code and the project, but to these applications themselves. So the entire code that describes how are the pages laid out? What panes do you have? What data set transforms are you working with? Are all standardized in this syntax that we call the specification. And so you could give this to a community member, to a fellow map maker. They can take this code, fork it, and then make their own version of it, give, give it their own perspective, change things based on what they think it should be, and then you come back and you can reconcile those. It's just kind of a copy paste to fork and then work with the, this sort of specification. So, Suppose you were compelled by that demo or you have another open source project you've been wanting to contribute to, how do you get started? I wanna note here that if you remember just one thing from this presentation, it's that the time that you spend on open source projects is an investment to a shared community working on a shared toolkit. That time comes back to you and your work, the people around you in that community and ultimately to yourself. So that's a pretty lofty goal but I wanna take a step back and reduce that barrier to say there are tons of ways to make open source contributions. Uh, it's a lot more than just that kind of core code uh, sort of operation, right? So I list a few here from using and exploring the project and telling people how you're using it, thinking about uh, commenting on the new proposals and what's going on with that project, where it's headed, uh, steering that. Thinking about Matico, we sort of have a couple different uh, ways we're thinking about it. Is, it. is it, do you want to make contributions for users or potentially for developers? Do you want something in, in the kind of visualization world or the data world, right? So it, this is a really kind of broad field. Everything from making bug reports to making blog posts to cur curating new data that can be used in these applications uh, to proposing map styling options or even bringing in a new map rendering library. Uh, for Matico, we have a couple different options, but uh, there are tons out there that are super powerful. So it, it's a really wide open field and breaking the ice and getting into it both empowers you to really make an impact on these tools and also empowers the communities who are working on these to understand what you need out of these tools uh, and what they might be capable of. So uh, with that, I'm gonna say thanks. I have uh, some links here for stuff. Uh, as well as my uh, slides uh, today uh, and the demo, uh, that little demo application I showed you of the R world and data, uh, COVID world data. Um, I wanna thank you guys so much for being here. I uh, appreciate your time. Um, and yeah, feel free to ask any questions and come up and talk later. So thanks so much.